back in the 1980s, the comedy scene was less of a comedy scene and more of a cabaret scene. And when anyone ever talks about that late 80s, early 90s cabaret scene, the one act that would always pique my interest was the Iceman. The Iceman would melt blocks of ice on stage using props and apparatus, the goal being that he wanted a duck to float in the water, but there was never enough water in the time he was given from the ice melting to, yeah, chaos. But beautiful chaos and I always wanted someone to write a book or make a documentary about him so I could learn more about him and then a few weeks back I got an email from the lovely folks at Go Faster Stripe announcing that they were just about to release Melt It, a book all about the Iceman written by Robert Ringham, someone whose work I really enjoy and I was stoked. I, I could not wait to read this book and Later that day, I got a lovely message from Robert saying that he'd seen a few of my interviews and asked if I was interested in interviewing the Iceman. I don't think I've said yes to anything quicker before. I was so excited and he was everything I wanted him to be. I mean, we chatted for about an hour and 20. You're only going to see about 38 minutes of that. And, you know, I think if you saw the full thing, you would probably thank me. This will need a lot of editing. It's going to challenge you. Without further ado, one of the most chaotic interviews I've ever done, but genuinely one of my favourites. Ladies and gentlemen, interrupting me literally from the start, the Iceman. Today's guest my is... My good salesman. You're a, you're, an, you're a brilliant salesman, Iceman. Today's guest is performer, artist and ice block melter... The Iceman. How are you? Here's my little baby block. <laughs> what do you reckon? That's so good. I can't. Uh, th- I, when you said baby block, I thought it was going to be like a, the size of a butter block or something. It's huge. <laughs> An ice cube, yeah. <laughs> no, it's reasonably substantial, but it's still a young baby. Oh. <laughs> so we're, obviously, we'll get into it. But into the block. Yeah, we'll get into the block as well, I'm sure. I have left the building. Am I annoying you yet? No, not at all. Good, good. I'll put it here. Do you want to explain the the act that you're famous for, the, the, the act that you did in the, the eighties? Well, thank you. It's very kind of you to call me call it famous. <laughs> um basically I used to get blocks of ice and proceed to try and melt them, but really not have much effect. So in one sense, it's a study in failure, but out of that failure comes success, we hope. And that's implicit in the fact that in a warmer environment, the ice will melt sooner or later. So... I think that's the sort of, is dichotomy a good word? I mean, it's a great it, word. I don't, I don't know what it means, but it's a great word. Nor me. <laughs> you you um, say like you you sell you say you seldom achieve to melt the block. So is that the goal? Is the goal to melt the block? I think the goal is to project my own situation through the block. Yes, sort of sharing experience. I think that was it in a way. But I like to share it in company. Yeah. Like this block, in a sense, is is in company. Um. But I, I think I, I, there was an element of, of entertainment. I think there was some entertainment, but it was mainly a byproduct of, of what I was sort of sharing. Yeah. I think the early blocks were, were the purest because there, there was less verbals, really. But in order to keep the attention of the audience, I had to extend it a bit. 
and I started talking, and I think that's when it went downhill, really. <laughs> We're here to talk about the the new book about you, Melt It. That's the one. Yeah. And I'm I'm rather proud of it, really. Yeah, it's 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 come out really well, hasn't it? With all the photos and everything. Yeah. I was wondering, had had you heard of Robert before he approached you for the book? No, to be honest, I had not. And he came out of the blue. And um, I was very glad he did. Because he seemed a clever person to me. Because he knows how to put things together. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And because I once I had the idea of doing a book and I did a sort of rather basic photocopy type book. And I, I only sold three copies, one to Stuart Lee. So I had a high status cost customer. Oh, yeah. But Robert approached me out of the blue and I think he was a bit disappointed because I had less Polaroids than he had hoped for, because I used to take photographs, as you know, I think. Yeah. of the blocks of ice and anyway we when i talked about my paintings we thought we could perhaps do a book you know combining the, the paintings with the photographs plus this intrusive interview <laughs> of me and um but it was nice to meet him because he and his team ryan and finn and and it was great that Chris took it seriously. Yeah. And I don't know, Rob just sort of seemed to have the know-how to put it together. And I need people like that because I'm not very good at completing projects, let alone melting blocks of ice. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned earlier about uh, Stuart Lee who's a fa big fan of yours, and um, he's written the afterword for your book. Yes, surely. What's it been like being, you know, having someone that famous be a fan and a supporter of yours? Does that bother you? Does that impress you? Or I think I feel rather touched, actually, because I think it's authentic and genuine. And to be honest, I, I don't really see a lot of the, the man as you said in the afterword, we sort of meet each other accidentally sometimes and we wave to each other. That's the closest of our relationship. <laughs> but what touched me particularly with the book is he wrote rather a lot. We, we, took it, we took some time to track him down. So he was really rather eloquent, as he can be, about my little performance art. Whereas Simon Munnery in the introduction was very <laughs> concise and yeah. concentrated on a particular block. I think it was 125, was it? Yeah, I think so. So it's quite a nice contrast from the short, sharp introduction from Simon Munnery and the rather poetic, dreamlike afterword from Stuart Lee. So, yeah. yeah. But I've always been aware of him, but I've never been really a sort of verbal comedian, although I, I have spoken during the, the performances. So, I don't know, I suppose I'm a slightly different type of genre. But I feel like Stuart's the type of person that he only talks about things if he's passionate about it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And as I said to you in when I was emailing you, I was, for a while, there, there was a part of me that thought you didn't actually exist and Stuart and Richard Herring had just made you up. Yes, that's interesting. Yes, funny enough, I had an email from Richard Herring, and in it he said, words to the effect, I don't know if I've seen you or not, because the legend is so strong. <laughs> so I thought that's quite amusing, really. <laughs> but perhaps an element of truth. Yeah. I don't know, quite, I don't know how the legend formed. I, I suppose just because I'm doing something slightly offbeat. Yeah, but it's clearly memorable to people, isn't it? Cause yeah. It's, 
when people refer to that cabaret circuit of like the late eighties, you always get brought up as like, and there was there was a guy who used to melt blocks of ice as like, yeah, and then I disappeared. I mean, the best thing to to be a cult figure, the best thing is to disappear for two or three or four decades, and that's what I did. Is that was like. Any, for any particular reason, or uh, for quite a few, re quite a few reasons actually, <laughs> but but I never forgot the focus on the blocks. But I, I had other things that I had to do. Quite nice things. Are you, you finding this difficult? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm I genuinely enjoying myself. When I asked about doing like freezing a block for the interview, you said that the block has to know what it's for. What what did you mean by that? Um, did I say that? Yeah. Oh well, <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I I think I like to form a relationship with the block. Um, quite early on, even perhaps when it's in water form, so without being too indulgent I, I sort of have a slight ritual where I you know I fill my receptacle with water and I, I feel I want to bring a quality and a purity to the block and, and then once it's frozen um I, I see how it is and I visit it and like for example this morning I, I just reminded it that it was a pairing tonight um It likes to know what's happening. <laughs> it's really respect to the block. Similarly, I always, I always tell the duck about the impending block because the duck also likes to know what's happening. I don't know if you know about the duck. The oh, duck no, is a no, sort no. of gauge to how much is being melted. And it, it came from a hotel in Southampton and it, it's in the book. It's got its own picture in the book. And basically, it's in the bucket underneath the block. And as the block melts, theoretically, it starts swimming. But often the water is not directed accurately into the bucket. Therefore, it stays in dry duck. <laughs> that always used to go down well. <laughs> so you could say... A, a goal of melting the block is to make the duck float. Just from a purely practical level. Yes, I, I suppose in a way it's like being a catalyst. The Iceman is a catalyst, so he speeds things up yeah. a bit, but not significantly. <laughs> how's, how's the melt going with that block? It's pretty static, actually. I think I got it out of the freezer the last rather late. Uh, it came out quite easily because some blocks are quite difficult to get out of the out of the receptacle. But this one's a very calm block, actually. It must be your influence. Yeah, because you mine. seem pretty calm. I try to be. Yeah, I as I think that's certainly what I project. Even though sometimes I can be a big ball of anxiety inside, I still project quite a calm outer. yes yes that's good while um talking about Stuart Lee and Simon Munnery and your celebrity fans you um there's a quote in the book from Mike Myers oh yes like Hollywood superstar Mike Myers yes yes I, I, as you know he did the sort of what you might call the English comedy circuit so-called alternative in wherever it was the 80s early and yes apparently he saw my block 69 and he always talks about it and neil malarkey apparently tells me that he still thinks talks about it which is rather sweet i did try to get him to give a, a blessing to the book but i think he did. <laughs> it didn't quite happen but he he, he was touched i think um I think he calls it Melted 69. Yeah, that's what he thinks your name is. Yes, Melted, <laughs> either Melted or Melted 69. But I think it was 
funnily enough, the Banana Cabaret. And if, if I'm thinking rightly, I, I came in... Is there a balcony there? I'm not sure. I came in from above. And... And I... Um, for whatever reason, it had an impact. He, I think he quite liked it. You know, it's, it's sort of strangeness, perhaps, oddness. But I, I never really knew him as such. Yeah. Have you, have you seen any of his films? Are you a fan of his? Yeah, I find him funny. I, I like Austin Powers. No, no. Groovy baby. <laughs> It was quite hard work. I, I, I got some of my authentic equipment here. That's the chisel I used to do the ice with. That's my hammer. These are the original equipment. Oh, wow. I had a gun. I'm not threatening anybody. Did you just shoot the block? Unfortunately, I got the duck. Yeah, I was aiming for the block, actually. Poor duck. And that's the watering can. So at the end, I used to have this ready filled. <laughs> <laughs> and they would all be saying, you know, the idea of failure. And then suddenly I poured it out and there was water. But they knew I cheated. <laughs> they knew I cheated. It's all right, the block is still intact. This is my Polaroid, but I think I've run out of film. Uh, but that's quite a good camera, that one. Yeah, I used to uh, have one of those. Yes, I like Polaroids. Do yeah. you like Polaroids? Yeah, Yeah. there's something about the it, like the immediacy. I used to sing. I used to sing Idlewise. And things like If I Had a Hammer. or And also... Dancing cheek to cheek, you know, heaven, I'm in heaven, all that sort of thing, because it was meant to be quite poignant. So, in a way, the ice block was a background, although it was front ground, background to all the um, emotional, psychological things that I was trying to convey. Yeah, the the yeah. the ice was almost like a background, yeah. you know, like a like a side thing that was happening on stage while you were performing all this other thing. Absolutely. And I very much like Stuart Lee's reference to the Iceman is a blank canvas. I don't know if you've noticed that. In his afterword, he, the Iceman is a blank canvas on which you can project what you want or something like that. So I think that there's a big truth there. Yeah. I didn't realise it, but he's made me realise it. And I but very that... much like that phrase. So Stuart, if you see this, I like you've got, you hit the spot there. Guess what happened? What happened? I knocked the ice over. <laughs> it's changed shape. Just me. <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> and a brick fell on my foot. Oh, no. Yeah. You okay? Well, I used to get hernias regularly lifting the block. I used to get a lot of help from the audience. They used to come up and help me. They saw me struggling and they helped me lift the block. There's a corner. So, in a way, this is proving quite successful. Ah. How heavy was is a full-size block then? Extremely heavy. I don't know if you saw the photo in, in the book. I want to sell out so we do a reprint. Melt It, that's available from GoFasterStripe.com, that book. <laughs> but the Iceman doesn't want to be too successful, so don't buy it quickly. Um, it can be very heavy, the big blocks. Uh, in fact, I have strained myself. I've had about 100 hernias. Is that possible? But I used to be have to train quite hard. No, I've only had one, actually, but it was a double one. Um, I used to train quite hard to lift the ice. 
But I quite like the fact that it was difficult because that added to the genuineness of the effort, really. Yeah. Because it, it, it's all about a, struggle. This might be a stupid question, but is it hard to free... He, he, do you freeze something that big? Is it just time? It takes a long time, yeah. Yeah. I, was gonna say, you, I, I imagine it being frozen on the outside, but still water in the middle. I don't know why. They varied in, in terms of density. If you if you got if you had a quick spontaneous booking, it was terrible. <laughs> As you know, I, I think in the book it talks about the tunnel club where I, I turned a bucket over and water came out. Yeah. And I said I can go home now. And so I have had difficulties. But with the really big blocks for my big shows, TV and feature films, I went to a commercial outfit. I love them. They're called Eskimo in South London. And they're so non-fuss. You know, you just say, I want a block. I suppose they do it all the time for yeah. restaurants and hotels, I don't know, or weddings. But they, they, they just deliver the block. They're so reliable. And so for bigger shows, in fact, the one at the Royal Festival Hall, Stuart's austerity show, the one that ended up in the Thames, that was from Eskimo. And they just they just bring it along. It's lovely. And because that's long. I that's try and long interact with Yeah. I try and interact with the the person if if there's an audience, it's an opportunity to sort of perform, if you see what I mean. But they often deliver it early. I remember in Lahore or Posh, Posh in Pakistan or Lopindia or whatever it is, Peshwara, Karachi, I don't know. I saw when I was on the hippie trail to India, I saw a man delivering ice blocks in the heat of the day, well, it's morning, actually, uh, on a sort of truck, rickshaw or something. And I always remember that struck me. I don't know if that was the the genesis of the um, Ice Man Act, maybe, but I, I always have this memory of the fresh ice being delivered on this hot, hot morning. I was having a cup of chai in a cafe. But I don't know why I'm talking about that. <laughs> but you say but that I, there's 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 that experience, and then didn't didn't you get locked in a freezer when you were a young? Yes, man? Spud. Hello, Spud. Yes, that was uh, formative. I I was working as a proper milkman. I had a not a little electric one, a proper little diesel truck, and I went around villages. I think it was Oxfordshire, yeah. And I, I delivered milk. And I, I don't know if it was the beginning of the day or the end of the day, but Spud shut me in the freezer. And it was quite worrying. But I did my breathing exercises. It wasn't too bad. But he, he did let me out. But I, I, I did. It was long enough to be worried. Yeah. I don't know if that affected my art. It was years before I started melting blocks of ice. But if it's you know, sometimes you you don't even notice it, but your brain does. Yes. I think, you know, it's, it's quite weird to think how many blocks I've done, really. I, I wish I'd notated them more, but I did one round quite near where I live. I, I, I did a block at, I don't know if you know this area. I, I live in Dorset, Bournemouth. It's in Wimborne. I did it. It's a theatre called the Tivoli. And I did it for OAPs, a really big block. And now I'm an OAP, but, but <laughs> they quite liked it. And it connects, funny, because I used to live in a houseboat called the Tivoli, which sank in the Grand Union Canal. And I have a lot of connection. I mean, perhaps we all do, but I feel there's, I know synchronicity is an overused word, but I feel there's a lot of connections in my little life with previous experience. Do you, do you want to get in? Yeah. Yeah. This will need a lot of editing. It's going to challenge you. <laughs> yeah. Do you like the title? Meltis. That was your original stage name, wasn't it? I think so. And then I got called the Iceman. Do you prefer the Iceman? It's it's simpler, isn't it? I mean, Melt It explains what explains the act as well, doesn't it? One block after another. <laughs> And a really in-depth interview, isn't Read it? it. In-depth interview. Yeah. Everybody will understand the Iceman after that interview. 
Maybe, maybe not so much this one, but <laughs> definitely <laughs> Robert's a lot better than I am. <laughs> this is going rather well now. I'm beginning to relax. Oh, that's good. Yeah. It's still here. Ah, updates. Left, right, left, right. Have have we produced much water yet? No. Hmm. It's really weird. Look. Nothing. Well, one drip. That's the bucket that's meant to receive it. Yeah. Supernatural. There's no water. I feel people slightly misunderstand the, what I am. I mean, I think I'm. Yeah, I think I'm more of a concept sort of person. So, but because the ice one stuck so easily, I I sort of had to go along with it. Really. Yeah. It. I suppose it's. It's the thing people remember about your act, isn't it? Yeah. More so than anything else is that there was a guy block, melting a block of ice, so Iceman just fits. Yes. But I, I think with my painting, that's why I created a new name called AIM to try and distinguish from the Iceman performance. So I, I see Iceman as very much my performance name, and now I've gone into the realms of fine art <laughs> I now call myself AIM who paints pictures of the Iceman performance artist because I think that's what I was really I tried to be a comedian but realised I was a performance artist I did wonder about that because it's like most people who speak about you, you know, Stuart Lee Simon Munnery, Joe Brand are comedians Yes, but uh, uh, from all of you know, from reading the book and from you know what I know of you, it's like, well, it was more performance art than it was ever comedy. Yes, and I think that was acceptable in the early days, whatever it was, eighties. Yeah, acceptable but in the eighties. Gradually became less acceptable as people became more professional. I always thought junglers was quite a professional outfit. I used to do. A few, do you remember junglers? Yeah. I used to do a few blocks there, but I always. That was the beginning of like a rather professional comedian people. So I sort of thought, that's when I realised, I, I began to think I don't belong. It's more like a back room of a pub than a professional comedy club. Or... Yes. I mean, I'm happiest. I mean, funny enough, you talk about Joe Brown, who, who did kind of like call me a, a pure performance artist. I, I remember doing a pub in Clapham I think there's one man who was blind and deaf. That audience was was not was literally one or two people. Maybe there were two people, and she was sitting there, and I was sitting there with my block of ice, and we didn't really commiserate. We just accepted the situation. But I can't remember if it happened or not. But basically, it was a very small. If it did happen, it was a very very small event. But you know, once I got a block, I have to do something with it. So. <laughs> I never not do something. So for me, as long as somebody shares it, I, I suppose that's my main thing is I like to share it with people. Yeah. I mean, I've done yeah. a few blocks by myself and it's not the same thing. No, it needs that you to be sharing yourself as well as the block almost yes. with, with the someone block, else. The, the block itself behaves differently. Because I, I think they all have their own sort of character. What's that word? Anthropomorphic or something. Yeah, like yeah. human-like features on an inanimate yeah. object, yeah. And, I, you know, the, the, the duck, in a funny way, because it's been through so many blocks with me, I, I feel quite a relationship with the duck, which people may laugh at, but I would be quite sad if I lost my duck. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense because it's yeah. just it's been it's part of it's you know it's been part of your performance for so long, but it's been part yeah. of your life for so long, hasn't it? Yep. Yeah. And I remember I did a I did a, a French block once in near Fontainebleau for some kind of big business school, and it was really quite sporty, you know, rather posh, and I. 
I was quite surprised how they related to the duck. They they took, you know, they, they liked the duck, and I thought they would scoff, but they they seemed to like the duck more than me, really. But that that was the interesting block because it it all, I mean I, I don't want to be stereotypical, but it it sort of almost had a edible feel to. I mean, the French are great cooks, aren't they? Yeah. And, and that block almost had a aroma of nice food. Quite weird. How you know your environment can affect the block. And, and the French water was different. Uh, I, I, I was going to say the water. Yeah, it, I it was. It was very different from a UK block. It's the only one I've done abroad. Because as as silly as it sounds, they always say that like if you if you buy Guinness in Dublin when it's brewed at the proper Guinness storehouse, it tastes completely different to Guinness you buy anywhere else because <laughs> I it's, believe that. it's yes, a no, specific I that. type of water that comes into that factory. That yes, it's in. it's the ambience, the ambience. And it makes the difference. So it's it's got to surely, you know, if you're if you're taking the water from, you know, near your home or from France or f- from Edinburgh or wherever, it's gonna be the blocks are gonna be different because the water's yeah. different. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I, I I I do find that looking back at my blocks, there's the the behaviour of different blocks is quite strikingly different sometimes. I think in the book I refer to one at Battersea Art Centre that I did, which flew literally, like with wings, from the support structure back into the bucket, as if saying, I don't want to do this. Yeah. And the audience, as I said in the book, I think. Melt it, available <laughs> from Go Fest to Strike. They thought, they, thought they thought it was a stunt. They thought it was a you know a specially contrived trick. This happened, but that was very weird. Do you have a favourite block? Is there one that you sticks out to you more than the others? Um. Well, actually, I do. Do you want to know? Yes, Which please. One? Block number one. Because it was so, you know, it was so fresh, you know, and it was this club in Chelsea called Crazy Larry's. I've got a painting of it, if you want to look out for it. It's called, I think it's called Crazy Larry's. And I just remember that it was so fresh. I didn't really have any idea what I was going to do. And I, I had a big old fashioned kitchen sink, I remember. So basically, it was mainly horizontal. <laughs> I was literally flat out on the ground, like swimming amongst my equipment and bits of ice. And people were amused and shocked, I think, at the same time. So but that's definitely my favourite block ever. You can buy the painting. from. It's only about £4,000, that one. The reason it's so valuable, apart from being rather good, is it's the first one. Not the first painting, but the first block. Yeah, it it makes sense as as soon as you said it. Like, of course, that's the the most special one. Yeah, I think I quite like number sixty nine because partly because of the Mike Mars connection, but partly because I remember it. In, unless I'm confused, uh, the the idea of coming down from a height. <laughs> I'll probably discover it's a very low venue, but. I do remember climbing down. Before Robert, you said that you'd had a go at making a book. Is Had anyone else ever approached you about a book or a documentary in the past? No. No. <laughs> but then I was, out, I was inaccessible. Ah, okay. But I think, until I set up my little website, I think people... Didn't really thought I'd died probably. <laughs> so I don't know why that made me laugh. <laughs> but now I've re- resuscitated the whole concept with, as you probably know, but with my paintings. Yes. I've got a few behind. Do you want to see an example? Yes, please. You sure? 
Yeah, I, I love the paintings that are in the book. Um, can you see that? Yep. You see the block? Yeah. There's almost two, like that one, oh, that one, and that one. And that's me. Can you recognize me? Yeah. Have you have you got horns? <laughs> that's my di. Well noticed, but that's my de isospray. spray. Ah. I don't know if you knew. I used to have it on my head, and I used to spray it, and I'd say something like, "The ice man is a de isospray spray" or something silly. <laughs> and it was all about ozone holes and stuff. But that's one example. It's so How good. Incidentally, you may laugh. Yeah. Most people do. I've got an I've got an actual formal art exhibition coming up in July in a farm in Dorset. But it's a proper art gallery. It's uh, called Goggleton Farm Arts. And my opening night is the 7th of July and it goes on to the 5th of August. It's in the pigsty. <laughs> I'm actually going to have the paintings on a wall, like a proper gallery. Yeah, that's the, I'll, I'll have to come down. That's so. That sounds so I good. I hope I'm you gonna, do. Yeah, it's very difficult to get to. It's builders um, creating space, one thousand block clearance sale, because I've got about a thousand paintings now, and I've only sold about ten, so I've got nine ninety to 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 lose to get sold. The prices are quite manageable. There's going to be security because some people think they're very valuable. But I, I I'm really, to be honest, I'm really excited about that because it's my new sort of persona, really. And also the still performance element, because although I'm not really melting a block of ice, or there will be one in the farmyard, I'll be interacting with potential buyers. So that's my new performance, really. The only times I get a sale is when I approach people directly. I always think it'd be interesting to take a like a brand new book and put it in a like, you know, inscribe you know, inscribe it and then put it in a charity shop or something like that. So like yeah. someone can stumble upon it and Yes. Exactly. I, I like that accidental sort of thing. I'm a great believer in the accidental which happens in my painting as well. But today's coffee shop was slightly more sceptical. It was a similar branch near me because I'm in a very sort of studenty young people's area. But they said, oh, just get stolen. And I said, well, maybe that's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They weren't so keen in this one. But the other coffee shop was a Venezuelan waitress, very nice, called Whiskey. Well, it's not a real name, but it sounded like Whiskey. And, and she was the one who sort of accepted it. And I asked her if she read it today. She said, I read the blurb on the back. But that's the start, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's. I mean, that's supposed to what, in, in to, like, that is, oh my God, why can't I speak? That is what is supposed to entice people to buy the book, isn't it? The blurb on the back. So. Blurb, yes. Written by Rob Ringham. I think rather well, yeah. The, the very talented Rob Ringham. Yes. A good man. Yeah. Make sure you don't edit that out. Because <laughs> no, I actually, I very much appreciate Rob because he's, I've only met him once, but he, he just sort of, he seems to not waste energy, he just gets things done, which is amazing because I I think I've a slightly different phenomenon. But also he seems genuinely appreciative of the, the Iceman. Iceman. Thank you ever so much for talking to me. I hope everyone goes out and buys a copy of the book, Melt It from Go Faster Stripe, and learns all about you with um, Robert's in-depth interview and all your paintings and photographs. Thank you ever so much for talking to me. And Mark, I would like to say thank you. Thank you for your forbearance.
you have to polish yourself, Mark.